folks. Yo! We're, we're about to get started. Um, afternoon announcements from the con. Uh, something perhaps your mother taught you. Don't poop where you eat. And please do not be hacking the hotel ATM machines or other hotel uh, property. We're their guests and we like it here and we would like to come back. Um, I've got Schwag. Uh, Alex is going to talk to us about uh, evasive malware attack and defense. Um, I've got Schwag to give away. Uh, so a question vaguely related to the talk. Uh, the, the trouble here is trying to identify something that doesn't want to be identified and is trying hard to look like something else. Whose tagline was it to say, hello, is this the party to whom I am speaking? You, sir, have won a moose nerf ball thing. <laughs> and what was the answer? Lily Tomlin, her character Ernestine, would, would play a phone operator and say, hello, is this the party to whom I'm speaking? And then silliness ensues. And this one just gets thrown. Heads up back there. Take it away, Alex. Thanks. Hi. Uh, all right. Hi. Uh, so my name is Alex Bulazel. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Yenner, my advisor from college, who was a collaborator in this research, cannot be here today. So it's just going to be me presenting solo. Uh, today we're presenting on a, a decade of evasive malware attack and defense. So just getting up into it, a uh, little background on me. I, I am a researcher at Riverloop Security. Uh, and a 2015 graduate of RPI and a proud member of RPI SEC. I know there's some RPI SEC guys in the audience. Good to see you. Um, and th this work was a collaboration with me and my advisor, Dr. Bullen Yenner, at RPI. Um, it's great to be back at ShmooCon. Uh, this was the first ever conference I presented at two years ago. Uh, some work in a similar vein on attacking and sort of evading consumer antivirus products. Um, this work uh, came out of that same research that I was doing in college uh, under Dr. Yenner. Uh, whereas that work was much more applied, uh, actually reverse engineering and evading real-world consumer AV products like Kaspersky, uh, Bitdefender, and so forth. Uh, this is a more academic look uh, at the past decade uh, in this continual cat and mouse fight uh, back and forth between evasive malware and automated analysis systems which want to analyze it. Uh, this talk is based on a paper that I published out at the uh, Roots Conference in Austria in November. Uh, that's the Reversing an Offense-Oriented Trends Symposium. Uh, it's a new conference. Uh, Sergey Bratis actually organized it this year, and he asked me to hype it up a little bit to people in the audience. Uh, the goal is sort of be like uh, the Usenix Woot conference, but for Europe. Uh, so an academic symposium to publish offense-oriented work. Uh, this is the first year I was running, and uh, I published this work out there. And uh, I wanted to present some of my refinings here to a, a wider audience to be able to share this information with more people. Um, I do recommend you check out the paper if this interests you. Uh, it's available at that Git link, uh, the Git I.O. link at the top of the page. I'm going to keep that page up here uh, for the next couple of slides just so you can check that out. And my Twitter's there at the bottom as well. All right, um, so introduction. Uh, automated dynamic malware analysis is essential to keep up with modern malware and potentially malicious software. So you have malware authors pumping out millions of pieces of new malware daily. Uh, too much can be looked at by a human analyst. You need to step in and automate that. Uh, and the problem is that malware can detect and evade automated analysis. So it can detect that it's being run in a you know, sandbox, detonation chamber, whatever you want to call it. It can detect it's running there and it can behave benignly or behave like a different piece of malware and try to uh, you know, pretend to be something it's not so you don't detect it as malicious. Can you grab one of the other mics, please? Uh, sure. <coughs> uh, can you hear me better from here? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay, cool. Um, so the solution is to uh, detect or mitigate the anti-analysis behavior in the malware. Uh, when I talk about automated dynamic malware analysis, we're talking about systems like this. Uh, you might call them malware sandboxes, you might call them detonation chambers, uh, whatever you want to call them. Um, this is what we're talking about, where you're going to run the malware and see what it does at runtime and make a decision, is this malicious or not? You're going to learn about it, what kind of runtime behavior it exhibits, what files it drops, what network connections it opens, and so forth. 
Um, so you have lots of commercial products, you know, things like FireEye, uh, Cuckoo Sandbox you have, Anubis. Um, that's just, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about obfuscation, anti-RE, anything like that. Um, and so the motivation uh, for this research, which was basically surveying the past decade uh, of research in this field, um, evasive malware techniques are a really perennial conference talk topic. Uh, like every conference you go to, there's always at least one talk uh, on this topic. And to be honest, uh, a lot of these talks aren't very innovative. They sort of present the same techniques over and over again. Oh, you know, here's this VMware trick you can use, or here's this tricky registry key that you can check out. Um, it's uh, kind of a, I'd say sort of a stale area of research. Um, not a lot going on, at least in the sort of hacker community. Though there's plenty of academic work on defense, which you don't hear a lot about, um, sort of at conferences like this, more practitioner-oriented conferences. Um, these defensive uh, techniques, sort of defending against the VASA malware, are generally relegated to academic publications or trade secrets in product search and actually buy to protect your network. Uh, and there's been over a decade of academic work in this field, and no one has really looked comprehensively at it uh, and tried to survey that um, evolution of work uh, and capture it all. Uh, in doing our survey, we looked at about 200 academic papers as well as a number of conference talks in order to survey this field, where it's going, uh, where it came from. Uh, and writing papers is fun, at least for me. I really enjoyed this. Probably sunk about 700 hours or so into writing this paper, doing this research, all the reading and, and surveying. Um, I thought it was fun. Um, not for everyone. I will say this is more of an academic survey of the field and, and of the research in the field. We aren't going to have any crazy demos. This is more a methodical and comprehensive look um, at this field uh, from an academic point of view. There are, isn't going to be a, a crazy demo at the end or anything like that. Uh, so in scope, as I said, looked at about 200 works on evasive malware behavior, detection mitigations, and case studies in the wild. Um, in the interest of time, this presentation is just going to focus mainly on PC-based malware experimentation. We're not going to address the large corpus of work uh, looking at web and mobile malware, uh, which also has and uses the same sort of evasion techniques you're going to see in PC-based malware. Um, this, uh, this sort of work on working with evasive software, software that tries to behave differently or pretend uh, you, know, you can't observe it, is part of a longer lineage. Uh, you can go look back to the 1970s at work on software protection. Uh, things like games trying to prevent themselves from being pirated, for example. Um, but in malware, uh, it's been sort of a more recent development. And the first papers we saw in academia actually addressing this topic came out in about 2005. And I want to be upfront about the takeaways from this talk, what you should be learning, what you should be looking for as I talk. First off, uh, evasive malware and defenders continually uh, evolve to counter one another. It's just this continual cat and mouse game, upping the ante. Each side develops a new technique, and it's countered by the other. Uh, the fight between malware and analysis systems is likely to continue long into the future. It's far from being solved, unfortunately. And there are immense challenges to experimental evaluation, experimental integrity, and the ability to establish ground truth uh, about this sort of work. It's very hard to make empirically verifiable claims about solutions that claim to counter an evasive, a piece of evasive malware or a particular technique. And it's very hard to know if a particular solution that you're proposing is actually countering evasive malware. Uh, and we're going to talk through why that is later in the presentation. Again, here's the paper if you're interested. Uh, I do recommend checking this out. Um, if, if this excites you, this paper is much more comprehensive than what I can cover just right now on stage. So that was sort of the introduction. And to give you an outline of the talk, first up, we're going to talk about offense. So techniques that malware uses uh, to detect and evade uh, automated analysis systems. Then we're going to go through defense and actually techniques of detecting anti-analysis in malware. Then we're going to cover mitigating, uh, so actually stopping the malware from being evasive and being able to continue analysis. Then some discussion and conclusion. And I do want to say at this point, does anyone have any questions before I dive into the research and the survey? No questions? All right. I'm going to dive right in. So first off, I just want to give a, a sort of survey on these evasive malware techniques that malware can use to detect and evade analysis systems. When we're talking about these techniques, we're talking about conditional evasion techniques, meaning the malware is going to look for a particular identifier of the environment, and then, based on that identifier, make a Boolean choice. I'm going to run or I'm not going to run. We're not talking about tricks like stalling, for example, where the malware might say, let me sleep for 10 hours before I actually run, or let me run this for loop you know, a trillion times before I run. That's sort of out of scope. We're looking just at malware says, am I running in FireEye? Yes or no, then I will decide to run or not. Um, 
And we broke down into, I think, eight categories, the sort of techniques that malware might use to do this. And we're gonna walk through those. Uh, first off, environmental artifacts and timing artifacts. So environmental artifacts are the sort of simplest uh, way that malware can detect that it's running in an automated analysis system. These are unique distinguishing characteristics of the system itself. So a hard-coded username, if your username is hard-coded to sandbox, that's a real giveaway that you're running in this automated analysis system. So the malware can go out in the wild, uh, look at usernames and systems in the wild, you know, call back to a C2 server and say, these are all the usernames I've seen in the wild. Uh, we think these are associated with particular malware analysis sandboxes. Uh, you could have system settings, uh, the date, if you have a like, hard-coded date and you're not really updating the date in real time. Uh, even the number of CPUs or the amount of RAM in your system. Modern systems generally are multi-core, um, but with these automated analysis systems, they generally want to conserve resources that might be running on a single CPU with one gig of RAM. And that really stands out uh, relative to the systems you might infect in the wild. <coughs> uh, timing artifacts are timing discrepancies in analysis systems. <laughs> Um, so this is, if I'm running an analysis system, say on top of Kimu, VMware, VirtualBox, Zen, whatever it may be, generally these systems are based on hypervisors, emulators, virtualization systems, VMs, things like that. And VMs and emulators are going to introduce uh, some timing discrepancy relative to a real system. Uh, so certain operations will generally take longer in VMs. There are actually some that can be shorter. Um, but as you're emulating code, as you're capturing system calls, as you're trapping, things like that, that's going to induce an observable overhead um, that malware can look for and say, you know, I saw that this operation that should take uh, 20 nanoseconds took uh, 200 nanoseconds. This is a giveaway that I'm running in an emulator. Uh, and these are actually really challenging to mitigate against. Uh, Garfinkel et al., some researchers at VMware, pointed out uh, that mitigating these re artifacts uh, requires extreme engineering hardship and huge runtime overhead. And actually attempts to mitigate against the use of timing attacks can then itself introduce more timing overhead. Uh, if you have some code that handles every time the malware tries to take a timing with, say, an RDTSC, that code itself, when it has to run every time you do RDTSC, can itself add more runtime overhead in the long run. CPU virtualization and process introspection. So CPU virtualization artifacts are artifacts that arise uh, when you're looking at things like Kimu or VirtualBox. Uh, when you're emulating, say, privilege instructions, or in the case of an emulator, emulating all instructions, uh, there can be discrepancies in CPU behavior if you have an emulator. So uh, if a normal CPU has a particular odd edge case when you run this obscure instruction, you know, and the, the Z flag is set, zero flag is set, and then this other flag is set, then do this. Uh, maybe the developers of Kimu didn't exactly capture that behavior, uh, and your malware could run that instruction, see that there's some erroneous behavior that a real CPU wouldn't have, and, and know that it's running an emulator because of that. You could also have things like model-specific registers for a particular CPU, um, discrepancies in the SIDT and SGDT instructions when you're looking at uh, global descriptor tables, um, things like that. Uh, erroneous exception behavior. For example, with Kimu, you can run instructions that are longer than 15 bytes long in x86. On a real x86 processor, if you have an instruction longer than 15 bytes long, the processor will throw an exception. Kimu won't. So you could just prefix your instruction with, say, 20 uh, rep prefixes and just run it and it'll run fine. Uh, and then process introspection. These are discrepancies in internal state of the process. Um, commonly used in anti-DBI, anti-dynamic binary instrumentation. So if you're trying to detect an analysis framework like Dynamo Rio or PIN, you'll often use these techniques. Um, so this could be looking at discrepancies in memory or register contents. Uh, if, for example, PIN has made allocations on the heap uh, to accommodate its local storage, you might be able to look for those allocations in the heap and know that PIN is running in your process. Uh, if you've hooked functions for analysis, uh, I could look for function prologs and find those hooks. Uh, page permission eccentricity is another one. Uh, if you're twiddling with page, uh, page permissions, so you can say trap on a memory access to a particular page, uh, that's something you could use to, to detect uh, process introspection. So detect something like PIN or uh, Dynamo Rio instrumenting your process. Reverse Turing tests, these are some of my favorite uh, sort of attacks against uh, automated analysis systems you can use to detect them. Uh, this is sort of an inversion of the traditional Turing test where a person decides, are they interacting with a human or a computer? And it's an inversion that the, the computer is now deciding, am I talking to a computer or a human? And we categorize these into three broad, stroke, broad categories. Uh, passive, these are um, 
passive artifacts uh, related to sort of things you can observe as the user uses a system. The cadence of their typing. Uh, if I have a program that's sending in keystrokes and it's just going stroke, 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 you know, uh, you could detect that it's monotonic, it's not like a real human would be. You know, a human's gonna have some change in speed from their left to right hand, things like that. They're gonna have a rhythm. Uh, you could look for that. Look, is there a human-like rhythm in the typing? Uh, mouse movement as well. Uh, process churn, are they starting and stopping processes as they go? Active artifacts, this is the malware directly engaging the user. For example, they could pop a, a UAC dialogue and say, you know, can you click this uh, button? Uh, ask me to admin, something like that, or click this OK button to run. Some malware will do this, uh, particularly in mobile apps, for example. Malicious mobile apps will often only run when you have interacted with them a little bit or got into a particular screen or page. Um, so this is more active, seeing that a user actually is there to click buttons. And then wear and tear artifacts. Um, these are sort of at the nexus of passive and active artifacts, uh, looking for prior evidence of human use of a system. Um, so, for example, you might go and, and see, is there a recently opened files list, uh, in particular like Microsoft Word? Is there web browser history? Uh, in a mobile system, has the user taken photos with their camera? Uh, these are all indicators that a human has used the system before and just sort of that build up, that wear and tear of use is something that you could look for and detect. And then network artifacts. Um, these are artifacts related to the network instrumentation uh, and the networking of the analysis system you're working with. So for example, if I have a bunch of systems running in AWS in the cloud, uh, and I know the particular IP range associated with AWS, uh, my malware could look, uh, is my IP one of these AWS IPs, and use that as a strong indicator that's running an analysis system. Uh, network isolation is another one. If your sandbox is completely cut off from the network, you don't have network connectivity, the malware might choose not to run. Um, another really interesting one is unusually fast internet service. If you're running in a, a cloud provider and they have really fast internet that a average end user who's, uh, you know, home system you infected, um, you know, they wouldn't have internet this fast. That could be an indicator uh, that you're running an analysis system. So to discuss this, um, just to give you the refresher sort of on these analysis, uh, anti-analysis techniques and, and ways you can detect analysis. They come from a variety of sources, and generally those can broadly be grouped into underlying technologies facilitating analysis, meaning your VirtualBox, your VMware, your Zen, your Kimu, the actual thing you're building on top of, the virtualization, whatever that layer is. System configuration, so the particular username on the system, the software you've installed in it, things like that, the desktop background, whatever it may be. And then analysis instrumentation. So if you've injected DLLs into the system, if you have kernel drivers sitting there, if you have a process that's running and observing uh, the malware, that's another uh, thing the malware could latch on to uh, to look to detect it. Generally, we see a correlation that easy to use artifacts, things that are easy for malware to use, are easy to mitigate against. And then difficult to use artifacts are generally difficult to mitigate against. And just in looking at the research, uh, but the research and uh, findings um, in the wild, looking at uh, you know, blog posts and reports on malware found in the wild, reverse Turing tests uh, seem to be growing in relevance, and they're extremely difficult to mitigate against, uh, really challenging um, to prevent malware from using them to detect you. So that just covered the offense section. That was sort of a refresher on these offensive techniques malware may use to detect automated analysis systems. You've probably heard a lot of those in conference talks before. Just trying to give you a more comprehensive look at what those are as we move into looking at defense, uh, where you probably not heard as much about um, these techniques for mitigating against malware uh, using these, um, these techniques. Does anyone have any questions at this point? All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna jump in to talk about detecting malware evasion. So here we're talking about techniques for detecting malware that exhibits evasive behavior under dynamic analysis, but not mitigating that evasion. So just knowing this piece of malware that I'm running seems to be evasive, end of sentence, uh, not knowing anything more. You're not necessarily mitigating the, the evasion, you're not letting the malware continue execution, you're not getting a whole bigger picture of what it would do if it weren't being evasive. You just need to know, is it evasive or not? And this itself is a very strong signal of malicious uh, intent. Normal software doesn't behave differently in a VMware or a VM or whatever it may be. Uh, the, the fact that you're behaving differently and seem to be doing something evasive is a very strong indicator that you are probably malicious. And I would say there are comparatively fewer works on just malware, evasive malware detection than there are to mitigation. So early work in this field, probably the first paper looking at this problem of detecting malware evasion. Well, it's 2008, Lau et al. proposed DSD tracer. 
So what they were doing is actually running the malware and capturing instruction traces. And in those instruction traces, looking for known anti-analysis techniques. So particular things like running CPU ID, running RDTSC, whatever it may be, or making a particular system call, uh, you know, uh, particular calls they knew malware would use to, to detect uh, analysis systems, looking for those and saying, well, you ran, you know, CPU ID in a loop with RDTSC. This is a, a strong indicator that you're trying to do something malicious. Uh, the problem is this requires a priori knowledge of all the techniques that the malware may potentially use uh, to detect your system. So you have to have this offline knowledge, and then you can run the malware and see, did it use a particular technique that I've configured my system to look for and detect? Most works uh, beyond that uh, use multi-system execution, meaning running malware in multiple systems uh, and comparing behavior offline. So we're going to talk about that next. I would also note, I said, the 2008, this was the, the, the paper from Lau et al. Um, obviously, the history of malware analysis and even automated malware analysis goes further than back than 2008. But academia started really getting interested in these problems uh, around, say, 2006, 2008, that period. So again, we're looking at these more academic publications, um, more formal work in addressing these problems of mitigating malware behavior. Obviously. Um, Vendors that, that sell enterprise protection products or consumer antivirus products are not necessarily publishing all the techniques that they're using to mitigate and detect against uh, evasive behavior and malware. 2009, Kang et al. posed instruction level instrumentation. So uh, just like Lau et al., they were capturing instruction traces. And what they do is they run malware in multiple systems and capture instruction traces from those multiple systems. So you can capture from VMware and from Kimu, for example. And you can compare the instruction trace from those two systems. And if you see a discrepancy in the instruction trace, that could be an indicator of malicious intent, uh, where the instruction traces become divergent. So if your malware runs fine in Kimu but detects VMware, uh, you could detect that, that the instruction trace differs, and then you could try to find some root point where a particular value was looked at, you know, compared, and then a jump in one case went off one path, and then in the other went down the other path. Uh, for example, if it jumped and said in one path exited, and the other just kept running and was being malicious. Uh, the problem is trying to compare instruction level traces, it's just too low level, and it's prone to detect spurious differences in behavior. Um, it's actually quite common that two executions of a, one given piece of software will not exhibit the same exact instruction by instruction trace. Uh, slight variables like uh, environment configuration for the system, time of day, user input, these can all affect the actual literal instruction trace that you see as you run the program. So this is very low level, very granular, and in fact too low level. 2010, uh, looking at uh, Balzerati et al. looked at Kang et al.'s work and said, this is too level, too low level. We're going to look at system calls. So looking at the actual system calls where the malware is talking to the OS kernel. Uh, again, system calls are quite low level, um, but they're, they're interdicting those system calls, looking at them, uh, and then trying to do alignment there and see where the same system calls uh, executed by the same pieces of uh, malware in different analysis environments. So uh, did those differ or not? Uh, I'd also note Curate et al.'s work on uh, Malgene. They took system calls and they tried to use uh, bioinformatics-inspired protein alignment algorithms to try to align these system calls up uh, a little more advanced, a little more algorithmic. 2011, another year later, uh, Lindor et al. did uh, Disarm, and they looked at Jacquard distance-based comparisons of persistent changes to system state. So rather than looking at system calls, which are very low level, uh, you know, opening a file, writing to the file, closing the file. They're looking at persistent changes to system state. So looking at this new file is present on the system or this new registry key is present. Uh, and using Jacquard distances, sort of a way of comparing uh, two sets of data and seeing how similar or how distant they are uh, in order to detect um, these uh, changes and, and detect evasion or not. And then 2014, a couple years later, Kiara et al. did Bear Cloud using behavioral profiling. And their innovation was to ask, uh, what did malware do versus how did it do it? Um, so rather than even comparing persistent changes to system state, they uh, construct abstract behavioral profiles uh, where they're looking at things like, uh, in a Spanish language system, you might see a right to C Archivos de Programas. And in an English language system, you might see C program files. These are semantically the same thing. It's the program files directory. Uh, but the actual literal string path to that file uh, differs. Um, so by kind of normalizing these profiles and saying, well, we see this path, we know this to be the user's home directory. It doesn't matter what the exact user's username was. 
uh, you can get an even higher, bigger picture uh, look uh, at behavior in malware, how's it, how it differs between two analysis environments, or even many more than two analysis environments. So to discuss evasion detection, we see this evolution over time towards increasingly complex algorithmic approaches, uh, working on increasingly abstracted execution traces, it's using things like jacquard distances, then going to bioinformatics-inspired protein alignment algorithms, uh, text similarity-inspired algorithms, going to these more and more advanced analysis techniques. Um, Multi-system execution is a very common solution in this field of evasion detection. And I'd also note um, these algorithms are all offline. You're going to run the malware a couple times in a couple VMs, instrument it, detect it, and then offline look at those execution traces. And this doesn't really solve the problem of preventing malware in real time. If you're preventing, protecting your network and you get an attachment or an email, it, you don't want to know five, six minutes later after you've run out all these systems, compared them, was it evasive or not? You want an answer within a couple seconds, is it evasive or not? So they don't solve the fundamental problem. These are, you know, generally seen in academia. They're nice academic solutions. They're interesting, but they're not really stopping malware and the, sort of the front lines of this battle. Moving into talking about mitigating malware evasion, and I, I also want to say, is anyone have any questions at this point before I keep going? All right, no questions. Now we're going to talk about mitigating malware evasion. Um, so where we previously were talking about detecting it, just knowing is the malware potentially evasive or not. Uh, now we're going to look at mitigating evasion. So actually um, stopping the malware from using its evasive behavior, whether that's actively stepping in and interdicting the malware's behavior, changing register state, for example, or passively creating inherently more transparent analysis systems. Um, this is a longer section, so just a little outline there. We're going to move through about five different categories of ways of addressing this problem. Uh, beginning with early approaches in the field, uh, 2006, Vasuvedan et al. did COBRA. My understanding is this was actually the first academic paper to specifically look at this problem of evasive malware and, and sort of any way of analyzing that malware effectively. Inspired by Kimu, uh, these guys were rewriting code in blocks. Uh, as they execute it. So they have execution blocks that they're emulating, and if they see a particular instruction associated with anti-analysis in a particular execution block, they're going to, you know, knock that out and remove it, prevent the malware from using it. Uh, this is obviously big runtime overhead, requires a priori knowledge of those evasion techniques that the malware might use. Uh, it's not super efficient, but it was uh, early and, and pioneering work in this field. 2007, Willems et al. did CW Sandbox. This was a really seminal paper just on the idea of automated malware analysis in general. I believe it was published in uh, Communications of the ACM. Uh, and they used an in-system kernel driver, and they tried to hide uh, artifacts associated with the system. So, for example, uh, they would try to hide the fact that their kernel driver was there if I tried to stat a particular directory. Um, this was, you know, early work and being in box with the malware. If the malware privesks, it could uh, find those artifacts. And even uh, there were lots of things that they left out, lots of ways of getting around their sort of rootkit-like code hooking. Uh, John Oberhide, the guy who later founded Duo Security, actually did a whole blog post when he was a grad student on getting around CW Sandbox's uh, mitigations. So again, um, early work, inbox, uh, not super efficient as a result uh, because it runs basically at the same privilege level as the malware. Even though they're running in ring zero, they're still running within the same analysis system as the malware, so you're not going to be super effective at preventing um, malware from, say, privesking or just finding a way around your instrumentation. State modification from Kang et al., uh, building upon their detection work, which we talked about, the instruction level tracing, uh, they went and built what they call dynamic state modifications, uh, changes to specific registers and memory at particular times. So if the malware does a comparison and then they're going to have a conditional jump, uh, say a JZ, um, they might flip the zero flag um, so that the jump is or is not taken uh, based on what they want to see. So after they detect that this particular jump is where the malware jumps to exit, they're going to make sure that jump can never be executed by interdicting the uh, emulation and changing register state as they go. And then multi-platform record, multi record and replay 2012 from Yan et al. with V2E. Uh, they pointed out that these uh, dynamic state modifications are not scalable to malware that has multiple anti-analysis techniques and multiple anti-analysis checks because you're going to have to run them out over and over again and just get incrementally further in order to detect the latest analysis technique it might be using. 
Uh, so what they do is a really unique approach. Rather than mitigating individual occurrences of evasion, um, they make the evasion irrelevant um, sort of by running the malware in multiple systems and capturing data about certain executions and replaying them. So they will run the malware in an inherently more transparent system. So for example, a virtual box uh, or VMware, like a VM, capture all the results of the system calls and then replay those results of those system calls in an under analysis that's among a chemo. So if the malware is not using things like CPU, red pills, timing attacks that are um, at that sort of lower, lower instruction level, if they're just trying to look at environmental artifacts and things like that, the idea is that um, they'll be able to keep running it in this analysis system like Chemo that gives them a lot of introspection into the malware's behavior, lets them observe everything that it's doing, uh, while also not, sort of not having to deal um, with it, uh, evading them and detecting them. Um, then you had path exploration approaches. Um, generally, these, these two works, Mosher et al. and Brumley et al., uh, these works were using symbolic execution to more broadly look at trigger-based malware and any sort of malware that may or may not run for any arbitrary reason. For example, the malware is only going to run after a certain date or if a certain file is present or for literally any other reason the malware just might not want to run in your particular system, uh, forcing uh, the code execution down certain paths, using symbolic execution, uh, in Brumley's case, sort of more a con concolic execution, concrete and symbolic, uh, and forcing execution down different paths in order to observe uh, all the possible behavior that the malware may exhibit. And obviously this can be used to detect um, evasive malware and mitigate against evasion if you have a particular conditional jump. They can force you down both paths and see uh, what are you doing. Moving into these uh, approaches based on inherent transparency, uh, rather than specifically mitigating individual instance, oh, whoops, instances of evasive behavior um, or trying to protect against certain attacks, you had in 2008, Dina Berg et al. did Ether and moving towards um, inherent transparency. So uh, their innovation was saying, look at all these other approaches that have been based on emulators and virtual machines. They're going to use a hypervisor, um, Zen. Um, despite extensive efforts to make their analysis systems transparent by using Zen, which obviously is, has a lower runtime overhead than uh, an emulator or something like that, um, they, some of the later researchers, uh, Peck et al., were able to detect Aether. Um, but their work and their formalizations of what it means for an analysis system to be transparent were really important and are widely cited. And this paper is uh, important beyond uh, just the implications for evasive malware, but for malware analysis at large. This was a very important paper. A year later, uh, Nguy et al. did MAVMM, and they looked at uh, Ether and said, well, this is a huge code base of Zen. There's a lot that Zen does. We only need certain smaller uh, amount of features. So they built a custom hypervisor just designed for malware analysis. Very small, smaller trusted code base, just a small, lightweight hypervisor um, with the idea that this would be less code for, for complexity, for attack surface, for detection. Um, Unfortunately, they were later detected as well. Um, it's going to be very hard to rely on any of these uh, CPU-bound virtualization features and be totally transparent, but obviously it's better than something like a, a virtual machine or an emulator. Um, and then Lengel et al. did DRACVU, going back to Zen uh, and just doing injected uh, breakpoints into the code rather than simply catching system calls and context switches as were done earlier by Dina Berg et al. with Ether. And then the most recent sort of innovation in this field has been the move towards bare metal analysis. Um, so all these prior approaches, they've generally been the, the malware's the detecting analysis based on virtualization, emulation, things like that. So some researchers said, why don't we just completely throw out this idea of emulating or virtualizing malware, roll on the malware on bare metal, and then cement it there. It can't attack a virtual, an emulator or a virtual machine that simply isn't present. So in 2011, you had bare box. Uh, these researchers were uh, doing bare metal analysis, but actually just capturing um, instrument instrumenting malware with an inbox kernel driver. Um, so obviously that's very detectable. You were still vulnerable to, say, privesc, things like that. But otherwise, it was quite innovative. They were working on bare metal and just solving a lot of these engineering challenges associated with that. Um, for example, you're going to have to deal with turning the computer on and off like over and over again. Uh, Reimaging the hard drive, uh, power supply. How do you do that efficiently? How do you reset the system um, efficiently and, and make a bare metal analysis system work? Uh, bare cloud moved away from the in-system kernel driver and did post-run disk forensics, so more transparent. The problem is they can only detect 
uh, malware behavior when the malware actually modifies uh, and writes the disk, actually permanently changes the, the system state. So if your memory, malware is memory only or non-persistent, you won't be able to detect it with uh, these approaches. Willems et al. Uh, looked at hardware-based uh, branch tracing features with their work. I think uh, these features, things like Intel PT and PMU, are really underappreciated for malware analysis. Uh, and appreciate it in general. I know there's been some work using them for things like code uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Uh, but these are really powerful tools built into your CPU. Uh, for those who don't know, these basically let you collect coverage information, know when a uh, particular code is branched, or where it's gone, uh, collect information about how many syscalls it made, uh, branch predictions, things like that. Built into your CPU, it's called PT and uh, PMU. Uh, so Williams et al. actually looked into using these uh, features in order to analyze evasive PDFs. Uh, so using what's built into their CPU to detect uh, evasive jumps, things like that. Uh, Spensky et al. did lo-fi, uh, actually instrumenting hardware at the bare metal level. So uh, instrumenting your RAM, your CPU, your, your buses talking to your hard drives, things like that, um, and capturing very, very low level activity on the system. Um, obviously, this is not something that's going to be scalable uh, to widespread use, but for a, a very tailored custom lab environment, you can actually go tap into your, your RAM and instrument all the, the reads and writes from RAM, the reads and writes to the hard drive, things like that. And then more recently, we've also seen some work on SMM-based analysis, running your analysis in system management mode on your, your CPU, very low level, um, you know, below normal operation, below what the user can observe. Uh, if you can put your code there, you're going to have full system uh, access, be able to read and write memory, uh, extreme, extremely high speed, and uh, it's impossible, almost impossible, for malware to know that you're there. Uh, Jang et al. proposed Spectre, unrelated to the recent CPU bug, and they got 100 times faster introspection than VMM-based introspection. So they were able to read and write memory 100 times faster uh, than they were with, say, a Zen-based solution uh, running at that level. Uh, Mult introduced SMM-based debugging, and then in 2016, Leach et al. did hops with SMM-based memory snapshotting, and they also did some instrumentation on the PCI buses of their system. So to discuss uh, these sort of mitigation approaches, uh, we see two broad categories, uh, active and passive mitigation. Active mitigations are detect, uh, then mitigate. So detect the malware as being evasive and then do something about it. Change memory state, change register state, whatever it may be. Passive approaches are based on building inherent transparency, using inherently more transparent technologies like hypervisors, um, like bare metal analysis, things like that. And bare metal is really the cutting edge of this recent wave of academic research and, and malware analysis. All these researchers have been looking at bare metal analysis, uh, but it's really not scalable to industry applications. It's not scalable to have bare metal analysis systems on your network protecting your, your say, your email system or something like that. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of challenges uh, to adoption, whether that's expense, uh, ease of use, and even kind of like stupid challenges like uh, power draw, um, like the fact that you might wear out the actual like, power button as you press that button 5,000 times a day in these systems. There's been just really hard uh, engineering problems uh, associated with just running a system and resetting it thousands of times a day as you, you try to run malware through it. How do you do that cleanly and effectively? All right, so that sort of concludes the, the survey section. Again, this was part of a much larger survey that I did. This is just sort of the highlights uh, of that work, just focused on PC-based malware. If you were interested in that, I really recommend you read the paper. The link is up at the top. And, and just to close out, we're going to go move into some discussion and talk about sort of the bigger picture of what we just looked at and where this field is going. And I want to talk about three things uh, we're in this discussion section. First off, offensive research. Then we're going to talk about defensive research and sort of inter interesting areas in defensive research. And then we're going to cover research evaluation and uh, some of these challenges to experimentation in this field. So first off, uh, interesting directions in offensive research. I think first off, uh, reverse Turing tests. Uh, as I said, I think these are growing in relevance. And these are a really interesting area of research is uh, you know, detecting, having a computer, being able to detect, am I interacting with a computer or another human? Um, 
And there's a, a big body of work um, in things like biometric spoofing you can look to, um, and also anti-cheating research for online gaming. Uh, so online games, MMORPGs, they have to worry about cheaters, people using bots, things like that. So that community of people has developed a whole uh, wide range of techniques for detecting, uh, am I interacting with a human, or is a human, you know, running a, are they running a script to input, you know, key presses into my game and mine gold or whatever it may be. Uh, so looking to those techniques and seeing how those can be repurposed in an offensive fashion uh, for malware might be helpful. Detecting bare metal analysis, as I said, bare metal analysis seems to be growing in relevance, at least in the academic community, um, and looking for ways of detecting these systems which are thought to be much more secure. Um, they, in general, are vulnerable to all classes of uh, attack other than those that specifically attack the, C the virtualization layer or um, you know, the virtualization itself. So you're not going to have CPU red pills working anymore. You're not going to have necessarily timing attacks uh, against uh, things like Kimu or VMware working anymore. But if I could have a hard-coded username in my bare metal analysis system, I could detect that. I might not have a real human using the analysis system. I could detect that. I might still be running in a cloud system with a fixed IP address. I can detect that. Uh, so looking to, to doing that and actually trying to empirically, you know, evaluate the efficacy of these techniques and capturing in the wild that's going to be a valuable area of research. Defensively, improving bare metal analysis is a really interesting area for work. As I said, um, this work is not ready for prime time for necessarily uh, consumer use or industry use. So looking into ways of doing that. And in particular, I want to highlight three areas that need work. Uh, efficiency, um, making these analysis systems efficient. If you're running something under bare metal, you can't speed up execution artificially. Uh, if I'm running you in a, in a VM, I can run the VM you know, faster. Uh, I can skip calls to sleep. I can skip sy very system calls that I don't want to uh, worry about, for example. Uh, if you're running on bare metal, it's going to take as long as it takes for Windows or Linux or whatever it is to actually run. Uh, introspection, uh, being able to get more information out, being able to have full system visibility, um, just, just like you would have with a VM or uh, something like that or an emulator. How can you do that with bare metal? Uh, SMM seems to be one way of doing that, but obviously needs more research. Just a very nascent area of work. And then stalling mitigation. As I said, you don't have any really transparency and you can't speed of execution. Uh, in a real system, if my malware calls you know, sleep for 10 hours, the analysis system obviously won't actually sleep for 10 hours. It'll just twiddle the system clock to 10 hours forward and continue on. If you're on a bare metal system that always sleeps for 10 hours, you won't see any activity. And unless you have instrumentation that can detect that call to sleep, you won't be able to detect that. So um, ways of mitigating and stalling behavior, um, which is a particularly effective uh, technique and a particularly effective attack against bare metal systems. Uh, heuristic evasion detection. Uh, looking at all these uh, evasion techniques, um, can the behaviors involved in evasion um, be detected condi before conditional branching occurs? So if I'm taking some measurement on your system, looking for some particular artifact, and then I'm going to choose run or don't run based on that, can we detect early on those particular queries to the system um, that the malware is going to use um, to detect it? Uh, obviously, some commercial systems actually do do this already. Um, but it's sort of more of a practitioner-oriented thing. Uh, you, you actually do see this in commercial sandboxes, commercial AV products. Running particular system calls or particular instructions is actually used as a strong signal um, that the malware may or may not be evasive. Um, they do take this into account, but I haven't seen any real publications or public talk about this. Um, I myself have actually been, um, I've reversed a lot of AV products and have been reversing Windows Defender recently and I've actually seen Defender do this in particular API calls. Uh, that they'll say, oh, you called this API, let's make a note of that and this is a strong signal uh, that you're, you're doing something evasive, something sketchy, uh, that you may be our malware. Um, but I haven't really seen any formal discussion of the ways that you can do this. Um, so I think there's more to be done there, more to be published there, um, more to be shared there. And then passing reverse turn tests, as I said, these are an interesting area for offensive research. And by the same token, defensive researchers uh, might want to look at how they can detect malware using reverse turn tests and how they can spoof human use of a system. Um, that could mean biometric spoofing research. Um, there's work from Unveil, uh, where some researchers basically created fake file systems that look believable. They used Markov chains to generate fake documents, fake PDFs, fake web history, things like that. 
Uh, Lariat was an information assurance test bed, sort of an early cyber range where they were creating fake network traffic and scripting out FTP accesses, email, uh, web browsing, things like that. Things that you might see in a real network uh, that a real human might create. So there's been research in other areas, but this sort of spoofing of real human use has not been applied uh, so much to this problem of, of evasive malware. So there's some research to be done there. And now I just want to talk about some of these bigger picture problems with this research and with the research that we looked at and tried to evaluate and compare. Um, first off, it is very challenging to establish ground truth in this field of experimentation. Um, the whole field is characterized by what we call unknown unknowns. Researchers don't know what they don't know. Uh, if you're working with evasive malware that by nature tries to evade detection, tries to not run, tries to keep as low a profile as possible, it's going to be very hard to establish ground truth about that. Uh, one solution is just having human analysts look at the malware, but that's obviously not scalable to millions of pieces of malware daily. Um, some solutions, some researchers have what they call what we call bootstrapping corpora. They will take uh, a, a previous corpus of malware that's been analyzed and say, well, this prior analysis is, is ground truth for us. Let's run it in our system and see if we can reproduce those results. And the problem is that there are uh, just various differences in execution environments and timing. You know, is the C2 server of the malware up or not? These can all lead to uh, you know, changes in, in the runtime behavior of the malware. It's very challenging um, to say, because this guy ran the malware once you know, a year ago, a month ago, even five minutes ago, that I should even see the same results when I run it in my system. Uh, and it's unlikely you will. And then collection in the wild is also challenging. Actually collecting corpuses of malware to work with is challenging. Uh, how are you finding evasive malware? If you are, are going to something like virus total and just pulling down files that have been classified malicious, evasive files might not be classified malicious because they are evasive. And collection sources may reveal biases. Um, if you're collecting with a honeypot, you'll get one sort of thing. If you're collecting from virus total, you get another. If you're looking for APT malware, you might not be able to find that in the wild unless you are actually a target of a targeted attack. So it's very challenging um, to collect malware, to experiment with doing this research. Um, and we also found that in this field, um, and, and looking at these papers, uh, evaluation ranged, rainly, or, uh, ranged widely uh, from evaluating things like a single piece of malware created by a grad student in the lab, where they wrote this piece of malware and worked with it, to literally analyzing millions of pieces of malware captured in the wild over years. Uh, it's impossible to empirically compare two solutions uh, when one says we have 100% efficiency against grad student malware, another says we have you know 90% efficiency against malware from virus total. Uh, these claims are so different. Uh, there's no commonality between them. Uh, it, it's very challenging to reproduce results, compare the research, say this solution is better than that one. Uh, and this is endemic in cybersecurity experimentation at large, but it's particularly bad for this particular subfield of evasive malware study. So in conclusion, we have surveyed uh, about 10 years of research on evasive malware behavior, detections, and mitigations. Uh, I have not covered mobile or web analysis and case studies in the wild. Those are covered in the paper if you're interested. Uh, and we see this just continual cat and mouse game that is far from being solved, unfortunately. Um, thanks to our friends. Uh, thanks to Dr. Broadus for hosting the Roots Conference, where I originally published the paper that this talk is inspired by. Um, you can follow me at Twitter. There's my Twitter. Uh, Dr. Yenner's email is there also. Uh, email me, reach out, send me a DM on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll also be here after. Um, thank you very much. Uh, right there. Uh, it's hard to, to empirically measure that. Um, I've seen statistics that it's something like in 2016, I believe it was north of 80% of malware if it exhibited evasive behavior. Yep. Uh, so the, the question is, with the adoption of cloud services, things like AWS, uh, is evasive malware cutting itself off from targeting by evading those systems? And the answer is yes. Um, you're seeing a decline in, in virtualization-based uh, targeting and evasion towards more subtle artifacts um, based on things like, is there a human actually using the system or not? Any other questions? Thank you.